Uh, we're going through this series called God is on the Move, and that he is. So uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. we got a lot of ground to cover today because I'm going to try to preach a really short message on a really long sermon. Does that make sense? A lot of the book of Acts is sermons, okay? And so we're dealing with one of the longest, well, the longest of them all, and that's that's when Stephen stands up and he preaches a long sermon. And so we're going to cover that today, all right? Do we got the chops for that? You put your thinking caps on, okay? I know we just had a lot of food on Thanksgiving, but we're going to have a lot of food today. We're going to have a big meal. I'm going to spread the table, okay? So we're going to have to really hone in here. We're going to go through uh, a lot of verses. Chapter 7 is one big sermon. Uh, you got some leading in material to that and some material coming out of that. And I am needing some water, so, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Thank you, thank you. All right. Brendan's a good guy. All right. <clears throat> so Acts chapter 6, uh, we're going to start in verse 8 today. So God is on the move. And do you know what that means? That you can't pin God down to one place, to one time. Uh, here recently, I, well, we were living in Vancouver. <clears throat> Uh, Washington for about seven years, 2008 to 2015. Then we moved over to Washington uh, for two, two years. And we've been down, been down here, uh, living here for five years. And uh, we, we happened upon a church that was called the House of God. I was like, wow, that's the House of God. I mean, what does that say about the other churches in town? I mean, God's home. You see these kinds of church titles, and I'm sure it's, it is a, a, it's a great church, and uh, they're doing a lot of great things for God, but, but the connotation can, can make it sound like God is just, that's his house. And you can't cage God up. You can't pin him down to one location, one time, and that's what we're going to kind of explore today, that God is untethered. He is on the move. He is not a sedentary God. He doesn't stay in one place, one time. He's always on the move. And so it's good for us uh, to, to remember that because sometimes we can uh, tend to uh, get comfortable. You know, always um, just settling in one spot and assuming that God does too. So the God that I want you to see in today's passage is a God who's always reaching, always extending. He is extending himself. He's always desiring. The Bible says in um, 1 Timothy 2, it says that God desires all people to be saved. Do you believe that? He has a desire. He has a yearning in his heart for every single person you have ever met. And I pray as a church that we will feel the yearning of God every time that God uh, runs your, has your path come into somebody else's path that you don't know. Second uh, Peter 3 says that God doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe on him, trust in him, put their trust in him would not perish. And the implication of that is if people aren't putting their trust in Jesus, they're going to perish. And God doesn't want that to happen to anybody. Right? So this is the God we're looking at today. And if we lose sight of this, and this, this appreciation for who God is and his yearning for all people, we can tend to play it safe. Because who wants to put their stuff out on the line? Right? We can tend to get comfortable. We think that safe or, or, or saved means safe. I've been saved, and therefore I am eternally secure. Nothing can happen to me. And the notion is just like, it's all about my destination. As if God doesn't care about anything else about others. So we hunker down, and we just go about our life, and fail to realize that he placed the church on mission. Again, I said a little earlier today, we're not a club. We're the church of the living God, and he has a design for us to be on mission. 
So our mission is to extend our reach. That's why we're supporting missionaries. That's why we want to send people out on the field. If anyone has a heart to be sent on the field, let's, let's get you ready and train you up so you can go. But if it's not to the end of the world, at least it's, it's to the East County. Right? At least it's to, to Gresham. It's, at least it's to a next door neighbor. Are you just going to stay at home on your computer and, and call that saved? There, there's more to this thing called mission than just me, myself, and I. Okay. So uh, here's the mission. Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8, and I'm just going to review this real quick here because this is important for us to grasp. Today, as we look at, at our section here in uh, Acts chapter 6 through 8, uh, it says, or Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon each of you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, this is, this is the early church. This is the, the, the disciples. Before Jesus, he resurrected, and before he ascended to the Father, this is what he said. This, this was his last words to his disciples. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You're going to start there. And in all Judea, that's kind of like the region. And then Samaria, which is up the way, which was a kind of sketchy people. And then to the ends of the earth. So you can see from this next uh, slide here, this, this is kind of the concentric circles. That th th these are the spheres of influence that Jesus has called us to. Right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And the, the ideal here is that we would spread out. Okay? He says, go to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit, and start there. And from that point, you're going to spread out over all the world. And up to this point here in Acts chapter 7, once we get through Acts chapter 7, this is, far, this is as far as we've gotten. Jerusalem. For the first seven chapters of this book, this is the sole focus. It's kind of funny, it's taken this long. Okay, but there has been, there have been labor pains, contractions. Uh, you ever go through life and, 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 and you would have just settled for what you had if there had not been some pressure applied to you in some way that moved you out of the womb. <laughs> you know, babies will stay in the womb just as long as you let them. Because that's a comfy place. I mean, you know, Hezekiah is loving life right now. <laughs> you know, he's digging that. And, and if he didn't know better, this is all he knows, right? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't like, you know, start breathing and all this stuff. He had, he's got all the warmth and, and the warmth and nutrition that he needs. A lot of us are the same way. We don't know anything but what we know right now. And so we settle. They settled in Jerusalem because that's kind of all they knew. And they would have stayed there had not there been some contractions, some inordinate pressure in life. And any time I, I sense that there's like pressures, inordinate, I guess there's pressures in life, right? But anything is out of the normal. I'm like, okay, something's up. I need to start listening. God is making this very uncomfortable. Why? And we see this starting to happen. Acts chapter 2, the church is born. It's established. They're in Jerusalem. And Acts 3 and 4, we see this first wave of persecution where they're sternly rebuked, uh, warned. They're in the temple. They're preaching the good news. And they're told to stop in no uncertain terms. Then Acts chapter 5, there is a second wave of persecution where they're like beaten. They're not just like warned. Verbal, verbally, they're like physically beaten. Anybody been beaten for the good news? Man, I have. Then this third wave, this is what we're looking at today. Okay? Contractions, labor pains. The third wave of persecution, somebody's actually killed. 
called upon to lay down their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of these took place in one location, and that's the temple. The temple. So up to this point, it has been all about Jerusalem. It's been all about the temple, and they have centralized around Jerusalem. And, and God is bringing labor pains so they will decentralize and start to go to the next slide there, flood into these other realms of, 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 of people. They want to get to um, the ends of the earth, but they don't know how. So God is on the move, yet the church is kind of stuck. And uh, what do you expect? We, we tend to prefer comfort. We stick to what we know. That's human nature. So Jerusalem was, think about this, geographically close, culturally close, relationally close. These are our people. It's easy to do life with our people, right? Just think, what, what are our Jerusalems? The people that we're just geographically close to, culturally close, relationally close, people that we click with. We have the same kind of worldview, right? That's Jerusalem. We stay kind of in those realms. But Judea was geographically close and culturally close, but relationally distant. Going out to somebody that, that, that you don't see the same things, you don't act the same way, you have different viewpoints. You're culturally close, but relationally you don't really know them. And so it's, it's kind of hard, awkward to, to step into those realms. And then you go into Samaria, which is geographically close but culturally distant and relationally distant. That takes a lot of nerve. And then you go to the ends of the, or, or, ends of the world, and uh, you got geographically distant, culturally distant, relationally distant. That's hard. But that's the call. Anybody up for it? A lot of silence in here. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you guys as we go through this, this, this message here is we're going to, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. There's a lot going on in this passage. God is shifting things around and getting us ready to, to launch into realms we haven't really been comfortable going. But that's what's, that's what's going to take to be the church, to be a church on mission. So it was all about Jerusalem. And they had a theological basis for this because in 2 Corinthians, or Chronicles, excuse me, show up that next slide there. 2 Chronicles uh, 7.16, God is speaking to Solomon. <clears throat> and he says this, For now, and Solomon built, he's the one who built the temple. He says, For now, God says, For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart, and my hearts, my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. So they had a theological basis for esteeming the temple very high, but they began to develop a God in the box mentality. This is where God belongs, this is where He's at. This is where all the activities should occur. And up to chapter 7, that's exactly what we see. All right. But does this mean that, that his love is confined to one place? No. Anybody who believes God is in the box needs to realize that God is on the move because he desires all people. So today I want to talk to you about extending, extending our reach, moving past the club mentality, moving past the comfort zone, moving past provincial thinking, moving past our, four, our own four walls. That takes some effort. That takes some nerve. So I want to entitle this message, Moving Past Our Walls. Okay, so today uh, my goal is to preach short uh, and because uh, we're dealing with a long text. So let me read this with you. Uh, we're going to read this together. Hang with me here. And I'm going I'm to ask you to activate your imagination and, and, and draw in, drink in the, the, the scenery. Inject yourself into this and let God speak to you as I read. 
Acts chapter 6, and we'll start with verse 8. And Stephen, one of the deacons from last week that we talked about, there's seven deacons, he's one of them. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. It's interesting here that, that uh, you know, this, this was, wasn't just confined to the twelve, signs and wonders. Right? So these deacons come along, and they're not ranked like under the apostles. They're ranked alongside the apostles. And that's really the view that we should all take. Even though we have different functions and roles within the church, we're ranked alongside each other. No, nobody's ranked over one another. We're, we're, we're brothers and sisters in a common cause. Okay, this is going to take forever if I get through. <laughs> and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then... Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. These were spinoff groups from the, from the Pharisaical movement. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated Men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council and set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. You hear that? This holy place, the temple. And the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Then I like this, verse 15. And gazing at Stephen, and all, and gazing at Stephen, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen was a powerful man, but he, had a, he was sourced with peace. He didn't have to have the external circ circumstances just right in order to carry peace. His peace was his power. Chapter 8, verse 1, And the high priest said to Stephen, Are these things so? And Stephen launches into his sermon. Hang with me here. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. And real quick here, he features the history of Israel because he's showing that he's loyal to the forefathers. He's loyal to the customs. He features three individuals here, Abraham and Joseph and Moses. And, and, and I think his intent here is subtle. It is to show them that he is loyal to the customs, but also that these guys experienced God and heard from God, and they didn't have to, they didn't have to come to the temple to encounter God. Follow me here. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in the temple? No. When he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there to this land into which you are now living. Yet God gave him no inheritance in it, not length but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years, speaking of Egypt. But I will judge that nation that, uh, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. 
And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs, the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. Where? Egypt, right? But God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom. So you don't need to come to the temple to hear from God. Gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh and the king of, uh, the king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt and died, and he and a father's. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, 400 years later, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph, who dwelt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in the sight of God, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house, and when he was exposed... Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of, of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, he's about an 80-year-old man, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame, a fire, in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look. And there came the voice of the Lord. You don't need to go to the temple to hear from God. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Interesting that there's holy ground outside of the Holy Land. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, 
God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers he received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him but thrust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech and the star of your God, Rephaim, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness. This was the tabernacle of Moses, the portable house of the Lord. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. The Most High is not confined to houses. Do you hear that? As a prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is a place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And then Stephen takes his bony finger and shoves it into their chest. He says, you stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Oh, they were angry. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, there's that composure. Full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing, he's usually sitting, Standing at the right hand of God, so as like to give him like a, a standing ovation. That was awesome. That was awesome, Stephen. Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and Stephen said, Behold, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That didn't make him feel any better. Out, but they cried out with a loud voice. And stopped their ears and rushed at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Whoa. I can't tell you how significant this moment is. The witnesses laid their garments down at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the first mention of the man who we would, be, who we, we would come to know as the Apostle Paul. An unconverted young man. <sighs> man, 
How many, how many Apostle Pauls do you come across in, in a day, in a week? Man, so much potential. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out. Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is a euphemism for he fell dead. And Saul approved, this young man named Saul, approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of what? They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, the very places that they were supposed to go, except the apostles, the twelve who stayed in Jerusalem. Devout men buried Stephen and made a great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word of God. Whoa. That is epic. And I hope you, you caught that in your mind's eye. How do we move past the idea that because we're saved, that we're safe? There's nothing safe about this passage whatsoever. Playing it safe, sticking to what we know, this God-in-the-box mentality. How do we move past our own four walls, the proverbial four walls that we put around our life, that we put around our church, that we put around our mentality and thinking? How do we move past? And as I was spending time with this passage this last week, just praying through it, trying to discern what's going on here, I think the answer is we need a purpose. We always need to rekindle a purpose. Why are we who we are? Why do we gather as his church? So I think we need a purpose, a, a purpose that connects us, because if, if I'm disconnected, I'm not doing anything great for God, right? If you feel like you're all on your own, man, you're going to just give way to, you're going to succumb to fear and anxiety and this and that. But if we have some kind of connection, purpose through a, a, a mutual connection with others and, and, and connection with God, then we're going to stand our ground. So we need a purpose that connects us with each other. And I'm going to call that our common purpose. I got a slide there. Our common purpose, and we need a purpose that connects us with the Lord, and that's God's sovereign plan. So we need those two things. There's another slide that says both of them there. Our common purpose and God's sovereign plan. You see it all throughout this passage. We need a purpose. So I'm going to talk about the first one here, make this real fast, just sum up some thoughts here, but this is what we need. We need a common purpose. You know, we've been so in, 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 in inundated with an Americanized Christianity um, where we get saved and, and nothing at all is asked of us. We ask Jesus into our heart and we're good. We're going to heaven one day. We got the ticket for eternal life, and we get stick it in our wallet and get it out one day when we might need it. That's kind of the, mm, the Americanized version. So it's kind of a, a, a consumer Christianity where we consume goods and services, and we make no contributions at all. We come to these big churches, and nothing wrong with big churches. I belong to them, uh, <clears throat> but nothing wrong with that uh, but the problem is, is sometimes they nurture our sense of anonymity. You know what I'm talking about? You can slip in, you can slip out, nobody notice you, notices you, and you can just come in and enjoy the experience. But 
you don't want anybody to really see you, and you don't want any obligations made upon you, upon your time. You know, so we play it safe because we wanted to stay anonymous, disconnected. We have these Americanized images, this, these uh, what I would call distorted notions of what church is all about. And you don't see any of these notions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you four here. But you don't see any of these notions coming out of this text. The first one is a, is a, is a gas station. Okay, this, this is how we're tempted to, as Americans, we're tempted to view what church is all about. This is a place where we come and get fueled up for the week. Come get a good sermon. Get, in, get, get some inspiration and then we get fueled up and then we go on our way. Do it the next, uh, you know, get, get filled up the next week or next month or whatever the, the pace of regularity we, we use church to get kind of tanked up. So that's one image. The second Americanized image uh, could be a movie theater where we come and be entertained. The entertainment industry is so huge in America. I mean, that's just, we're so glutted with all forms of entertainment. We don't know what else we should do. So we just go to the next form of entertainment. So we've grown accustomed to being entertained and can easily transfer those expectations onto the church. Am I talking to somebody in here? <laughs> the third image is a, a, a drugstore where we can fill a prescription, medicate the pain. We all suffer. We all hurt. And uh, this is a great place. And, and, and by the way, these aren't bad images necessarily, but they're bad if that's the only image we have of the church. You should come to church and, and, and seek healing. There's pain going on. But if that's all we do, then it's, again, what has a church done for me lately type of mentality. And the, and the fourth one here is a retail store where we come and get goods and services at low costs. We got products, we got programs, come and, uh, and come to church. But none of these images fit what we see here. I think the, the, the best biblical image, and we got several of them, several good ones, but I think the best one here, uh, at least for our purposes today, is the image of the church as a body interconnected parts, all having a role, a function, a purpose. I mean, you derive benefit from being a part of the body and you contribute to its well-being. Each person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus called the head and we collectively are called the body. And we are meant to be, to be together, attached Connect and not disassembled. What 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 could this elbow do? Just sitting over there on the that'd be gross anyhow. <laughs> right? I mean it, it belongs a part of the body. You are a part of the body. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are part of something bigger than just yourself. We're not just a group of individuals, we are a collective whole. And I think this passage draws our attention to something that's way bigger. And, uh, and that's the fact that we, we need the church, and the church needs us, and we are on mission. And it's so much bigger than what I can get out of it. So um, 1 Corinthians uh, 6.20 says, says this. It says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. I think that's one of the first verses I remember really making sense to me as a young man, early in my 20s, always trying to just figure out church. And finally, it clicked when I realized that right there. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And is Jesus getting out of my life all that he paid for? He, he, he paid so that I could be a part of his mission, be a part of his body. So I belong to you, and you belong to me. We belong to each other. We're members, not of an organization. We're members of each other, each other. 
So I'm not my own man. Uh, you're not your own man. You're not your own woman. We belong to something bigger. And who in the world lays down their life for a gas station? Who lays their life down for a movie theater? If, if that's our notions of the church, then we're not going to be sacrificing very much, and we're certainly not going to be on mission. All right. You belong to the body of Christ, and you serve a function, and that is our common purpose. And if you're in touch with that, you have a function, you have a role, you have a purpose, then we're living on mission. Okay, so we need a purpose that connects us with each other, and we need a purpose that connects us with the Lord, and that's this next piece here, God's sovereign plan. So we need our common purpose, and we need to know God's sovereign plan. So what we read, uh, what we read today is, is the worst and best thing that ever happened to the church. Worst because somebody got killed. Best, or let's say most, most significant, because it moved the church forward. She got back on mission. Uh, you could say it didn't really work out too well for Stephen, but if I know Stephen from this text at least, I think he didn't mind one bit. I mean, you know, we act like this world, this life is all there is, but there's so much more. And that life that we're heading towards, there's a whole other existence that we're heading towards. It's 100 1,000, 10,000, 10 million times better. So how, how does the worst thing become the best thing? How do the tragedies in your life, the things that you go through, the things that you suffer, loss, how do those become the best thing that can ever happen to you? And I would say trust his purpose. He's sovereign. He's in control. He can even make the worst things into the best things. That's what he does. The death of Jesus Christ was the worst thing that ever happened. But it turned out to be the very best thing. How could there be a resurrection if there wasn't a death? So you, when you reach a, 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 a death or a tragedy, just know that God can use that very tragedy, that very death to produce something so beautiful that you will thank God for. Romans 8, 28, we all know it mostly, says we, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. we got to get that in our spirit. All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Do you love God? Then the, pro, the, the, the promise is that God will use all things, even the tragedies of life to bring about triumph. So here's the formula. Trust plus tragedy equals triumph. Trust plus tragedy, trust in God, not just a generalized trust, but a specific trust in God and His purposes in your life. If you trust, He will make the tragedies into, the very tragedies into triumph. That's how He succeeds. That's how he gets his mission forward in life. So remember the mission, Acts chapter 1. Uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And this tragedy that happened here that we just read about actually propels the mission into Judea and Samaria and actually plants a seed in the man who would eventually become uh, the, the, the herald of the gospel that will take the gospels to the end of the known world. Saul was standing there. This is, the, this is the guy who would become the apostle to the Gentiles. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. Saul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. He takes his Greek name to the Greek world as a missionary. So God's purposes prevail. He triumphs through tragedies because of the trust that we place in him. So I pray that the Lord will renew and solidify our appreciation 
for our common purpose. We belong together as a body of Christ, the church. We're members of the church. We're members of one another. We have functions. We have roles. And that should enhearten each of us. If we're disconnected from that reality, it's very hard to live the life that Stephen lived. So my prayer is that we would renew and, and solidify our appreciation for a common purpose and for God's sovereign plan. You know what sovereign means? He's in control. Even when we're out of control, even the things that happens in our life that we would wish had never happened in our life, he can still remain in control and produce beauty out of ashes. That's what sovereign means. Do we believe that God is in control? Let's put our trust in him and he will bring the triumphs through those tragedies. God is not caged up. God is not pinned down. God is on the move. That's the name of our series. And to be on mission with him, we need a purpose that connects us with each other. We need a purpose that connects us with the Lord. If we're not connected with one another, we're not, if we're not connected with the Lord, we will not be on mission. Do you want to be on mission? Not very many people. Let's put our trust in him. He knows what he's doing. Miles Monroe said, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without a purpose. This life is not all that there is. This is just a foretaste. This is just a stage of preparation. He is preparing you to rule and reign with Jesus forever. And so therefore, he's bringing you through a process of, of refinement so that you can sustain the weight of glory that he's going to bestow upon you when that day arrives. So don't live as if this day, as this, as this, this life is all that there is. There is so much more. And in the light of eternity, uh, these small things that we go through, sometimes these big things that we go through are very small in comparison. Let's pray. Well, you have big plans, Lord. You have tremendous plans for your church. And I pray that our hearts would be soft, would be open, that you would speak to us out of your word, and that you would embolden us with a vision of eternity and a peace in our heart. Stephen conducted himself with, with such poise and composure, not because of his own makeup, but because of the work of Jesus in his life. And I pray that you would you would do that to each person who's sitting in this room, that our hearts would be remade to be people of composure, peace, because we have a vision of the future that is magnificent. So I pray, encourage us, O oh God. Make us forces to be reckoned with. Help us to make an impact in our world just as they made an impact in their world. It's the same church, and we say hey, we have the same Holy Spirit. So fill us now, Holy Spirit, we pray, for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet.